Awesome. Hey, welcome to church. Glad to have uh, you in the house of God uh, with us uh, this morning. Hey, one thing uh, to put on your radar, I know we mentioned it in the announcement videos as well, but we are so excited to be launching Pursuit Midweek starting here April 3rd, the first Wednesday after Easter, which means this. Wednesday night, youth group is coming, kids ministry is coming, men's, women's, small groups, it's all going to be happening Wednesday night starting <clears throat> April 3rd. Uh, at 6 p.m. I promise you don't want to miss it. It's going to be done well with excellence. And uh, so many folks have been texting in, emailing, calling, hey, when is youth group starting? When is midweek starting? And we're excited to be able to launch that right after our Easter Sunday on March 31st, Easter Sunday, April 3rd, Pursuit Midweek start. And so make sure to mark your calendar. We'll be glad to have you in the house of the Lord. <laughs> it's so interesting uh, to me in Christendom how uh, the enemy can tell us something once and we believe it, but the Lord will tell us something a thousand times and we need another confirmation. <laughs> it's like we're so easy to believe the report of the enemy, which is maybe why Moses and Joshua asked the children of Israel, whose report are you going to believe? <laughs> It's interesting to me, I always get the email updates from Google every time somebody leaves a review of the church. And can I tell you, it's either one star or it's five star. There's not a whole lot in between. Either it's the best thing ever since sliced bread or it's the worst thing somebody has ever seen in their entire life. We got a Google review this week and somebody was all upset and they said, I heard a rumor that this Russell Johnson was a pastor in Ohio. And he was arrested and put in prison for financial fraud. And now he's moved to Kirkland to try to fleece the people to set up shop again. Now listen, I've done a lot of dumb things in my life, but never in Ohio. It's a different Russell Johnson. <laughs> so just let me alleviate your concerns. I'm not a felon at this time. The Lord can do anything, but uh, anyways, we gonna survive. <laughs> Somebody emailed me this week, they're asking, they said, is this a, is this a Trump church? I said, well, I think Trump needs church, but I don't know what, is this a Trump church means. I said, this ain't a Trump church, it's not a Biden church, it's not a Republican church, it's not a Democrat church, it's not a rich church, it's not a poor church, it's not a white church, it's not a black church. <laughs> I don't know about you, but the right wing and the left wing, they attach to the same bird. <laughs> My eyes are on the dove. This is a Jesus church. <laughs> now, we ain't going to be afraid to talk about politics and public policy. And we started Pursuit Political Action Committee last year, and we're looking to flip school board races and make an impact in the education sphere, and I just want to use whatever tools and gifts that God has given us in this season to advance the kingdom of God. But I think so often in our own humanity, we are looking to try to classify the church one way or another, and in doing so, it moves away from its Christological foundation. No, Christ is the cornerstone of the church. He's the stone that the builders rejected that has become the chief foundation of our faith. <laughs> And I think it's important for us that as we continue the dialogue and continue to preach and teach from the scriptures and continue to share Holy Communion together and worship in the same place on Sunday morning that we remember that Jesus is bigger than every other identity, affiliation, or persuasion that we may carry throughout the week. Or when we gather under the banner of the Spirit, it is not young, old, male, female, Jew, Gentile, men, servant, or maid servant. We are one. And only a united church can heal a divided nation. <clears throat> but the reality is for you and I, friend, unity is a choice that we make. Because it is not a natural phenomenon, it is a supernatural phenomenon. The world is not geared towards unity, it is geared towards division, it is geared towards hate, it is geared towards retribution. But the ethic of the kingdom is upside down from the rules that this world tends to play by. 
which means that when we make a decision for unity, the kingdom of God becomes unstoppable in the Northwest. For as the author of the book of Psalms says, how good is it for brethren to dwell in unity? It is like oil that comes on the head of Aaron and drips down his beard and collects on his feet. For where there is unity, God commands a blessing. And the choice for unity is ours. The choice for preferring Jesus is ours. The choice for focusing on him is ours. And we make that determination every time we gather under the banner of his holy name. It is Jesus, which is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by him. This morning, I want to share with you out of the Gospel of John, and in doing so, look at chapter 3. Now, most people, even in our world today, even if they are not in church, understand something about John 3, because within it, we have maybe the most popular verse in all of Christendom. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. But what people often don't recognize is that famous verse is actually bookended by two distinct conversations that are happening in John 3. And this morning, for but a moment, I wanted to invite you in to the conversations that we read about in John 3, because I believe that not only do they reveal something interesting about the character of Christ, they reveal something interesting about the character of man. And that's what the Bible does from Genesis all the way through Revelation, is it reveals the brokenness of the human condition and the goodness of a God who has come to seek and save that which is lost. And this is what I love about the dichotomy of the narrative from one chapter to the next in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. You read one chapter and you feel down in the dumps, like how do people keep making these same mistakes? And then you read the very next chapter and you find out that in the midst of the mistakes, God is faithful to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even unto the thousands of generations that would come from them. And when I read the scriptures, I am encouraged that God has factored in all of the mistakes that I could ever make and still put his calling and anointing on my life. And if it's true about me, then it's true about you because God is no respecter of persons. He does not play favorites. For the woman caught in the act of prostitution, he speaks over her, where are your accusers? Go and sin no more. For Zacchaeus, the tax collector, stuck in a tree, he says, get down from that tree. I'm coming over to your house for dinner today. For Peter, who fishes on the Sea of Galilee, he calls him to be a fisher of man. Anywhere that Jesus goes, regardless of where people are at, he gives gets down into the muck and the mire of life and lifts them up and sets them in a high and a broad and a good place. And if you were to be honest this morning, friend, that is your testimony and that is my testimony. God found me in the worst of circumstances. God found me when life was overwhelming. God found me and loved me when I couldn't find me and I couldn't love me. And he put a new spirit inside of my body. He put a love inside of my heart. He put sanity back in my mind. He lifted me out of the ditch of depression and the problems of anxiety and he said I'm giving you a new name for I've called you my own and even while you was in your mother's womb he was forming and framing the very things that you are walking into today this is the goodness of God in the land of the living starting in verse 1 in John 3 the Bible begins to share with us these conversations Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. And this man came to Jesus by night. I don't know what it would have looked like on that dark night for a curious Pharisee named Nicodemus to seek out Jesus. But in 1880, the American artist John Lafarge painted this scene from John 3. And it would be remembered as one of his most famous works. And today, that hangs in the Smithsonian Art Museum in Washington, D.C. Outside of Christ, Nicodemus is one of my favorite characters in the book of John. No, he wasn't just a Pharisee. 
He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Judicial Council of Elders who oversaw the religious affairs of the Jewish people. This group of religious leaders, they were tasked with interpreting the Torah. They were tasked with ensuring compliance to the Mosaic law. They they were tasked with being watchful for the appearing of the Messiah. And when Jesus arrives on the scene, the Pharisees being blinded by the veil of the old covenant conspire with the Roman government to have him killed. So there's a reason Nicodemus would travel at nighttime to see Jesus, because if he were to be caught by any of his fellow Pharisees, his career would be over. His social prominence would end. His name would be dragged through the mud, for to see Jesus would be an act of betrayal against the religious establishment. But here's what I love. Before Nicodemus ever visits Jesus, there is a God who is visiting him. For the scriptures declare in John 6, no man comes to the Son unless he is first drawn by the Father. And Nicodemus is being drawn in with a holy curiosity that refuses to let him sleep at night until he investigates for himself this man named Jesus. And here's what I love. Nicodemus don't know up from down. He's not sure if Jesus is right or wrong. He doesn't understand what it means to be born again, born of the Spirit or what it looks like to inherit the kingdom of God. But at the intersection of holy curiosity and spiritual dissatisfaction, an encounter with Jesus breaks forth and Nicodemus's life will never be the same again. And whether you know it or not, you are here this morning by virtue of holy curiosity and spiritual dissatisfaction. You saw a billboard, or a social media clip, or a live stream, or you got an invite from a friend, or you got tired of dry religion and dead church, or the drugs weren't enough, the alcohol wasn't enough, the sex wasn't enough, or the depression was too much, or the anxiety was too great, and there was something inside of your soul that said, I've had enough, and I will not rest until I encounter this Jesus for myself. Hear me today, friend, my prayer for you and my prayer for this community is that God would visit us with an insatiable hunger that would continue to drive us to Jesus even when it's costly. And that's why John the Baptist was a reed shaken in the wind. That's why unusual miracles were worked by the hands of Paul. That's why fishermen were given power over demons. That's why pursuits started in a barn. That's why God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Because God specializes in using the strange and the otherworldly to stir the curiosity of a region until people are provoked to encounter this Jesus for themselves. Do you know that Nicodemus would only appear twice more in scriptures? Once in John 7 where he opposes the arrest of Jesus without a proper trial. And lastly in John 19 where he assists a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea in the burial of Christ. So what would become of this curious man who under the cover of darkness secretly sought out a Messiah named Jesus? Church history tells us that Nicodemus was one of the three wealthiest men in all of Jerusalem. After the resurrection, Nicodemus would publicly proclaim that Jesus was the Christ. He would be baptized by Peter and John. Soon after, he was expelled from Jerusalem by the same Sanhedrin council he used to sit on. His wealth would be stripped away. He would die in utter obscurity, but his testimony would live on for future generations to hear. And no matter what circumstances brought you to church today, oh friend, you can leave different than the way that you came in. And God can give you a testimony that will outlive your life. In verse 2, the story continues. So this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who is from God, for no one could perform these signs that you were doing if God were not with him. And Jesus answered, Oh, most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
watch what Nicodemus is saying. Oh, we know you are from God. And we know that you are with God. But the question that I am possessed by is, are you the son of God? Muslims believe that Jesus was a great prophet. Hindus believe that Jesus was a wise teacher. And, and Buddhists believe that Jesus was an enlightened man. Mormons believe that Jesus is a creation of the Father and that when he returns, he will land in Missouri. Now, if you've ever been to Missouri, you know that's not true. <laughs> the Gnostics said Jesus was divine, but he wasn't human. The Arians said Jesus was human, but he wasn't divine. But to be a Christian is to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that his father raised him from the dead. And Nicodemus asks, how can it be that you perform these signs? And Jesus responds, oh Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God, which is what these signs are pointing to. Hear me, friend. Beware of Christian movements that don't point people to Christ. Oh, I believe in healing. I believe in miracles. I believe in deliverance and the supernatural. But miracles that don't point us to the miracle worker are worthless. I believe in justice. I believe in feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, fighting for the window and orphan. But if the work of justice doesn't point people to the person of justice, it is meaningless. People still go to hell every day with healed backs and full bellies. No, signs do not exist as monuments unto themselves. Their purpose is to point us in the direction of God. Nicodemus says, I've seen the signs, and Jesus responds, now let me show you the kingdom. So I guess my question for you today is this, if your life is a sign, where is it pointing? Because if it's not Christ, it'll only bring confusion. And to be honest, I, it looks like driving in downtown Seattle. And to be honest, I think people are actually looking for spiritual and moral clarity today more than ever before. They're tired of people talking a lot and not managing to say anything of value at all. It might be unpopular to say, but it is still true. There is a real heaven and there is a real hell. And you will spend a real eternity in one of those places. Tomorrow is not promised. God will not be mocked. And there is only one way to the Father, and it's through his Son. Now watch the story continue. Verse 4. Now Nicodemus said to him, but, but how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a, a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And, and Jesus answers again in like manner, most assuredly I say unto you, no, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. See, that which is born of flesh is flesh, but, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. No, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. For the wind blows where it wishes. Oh, you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from nor where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the, the Spirit. And now Nicodemus poses another question. How can a man be born when he is old? Hmm. Dr. Guzik makes this point. If a nation passed a law that said no one could live there except those who were born in that nation... It would not matter if you spoke the language. It would not matter if you observed some of the customs. It would not matter if you dressed like those in that nation. It would not matter if you practiced the traditions. It would not matter if your parents were born in that nation or your children were born in that nation or how many friends you had in that nation. All that would matter was whether or not you were actually born there. Hear me. 
That was the condition of many in Israel back then, but it is also the condition of many in our world today. See, if you hang around church long enough, you might be able to speak the language. You might be able to observe the customs. You might be able to dress the part, but the only thing that matters is have you been born of water and of spirit? Because like Jesus tells Nicodemus, without a new birth, you cannot enter in to a new kingdom. And isn't that the problem we face today? People want a new kingdom, but they want to bring their old man. They want to bring their old customs and their old habits and their old relationships and their old bondage and their old religion and their old secretism and their old universalism and their old sexuality and their old identity and their old sickness and their old diseases and their old proclivities. They want to bring the old and somehow marry it to the new. But the scripture says, let the dead bury their own. You follow me. For you cannot enter into a new kingdom until you have had a new birth. But here's the good news. All who are in Christ Jesus are not just better creations. They are new creations. For the old has gone and the new has come. Now now watch. Jesus tells Nicodemus it's like the wind you don't know where it comes from or or where it goes but you can tell when it's blowing hear me friend I, I don't have to understand the entire spectrum of complexity as it pertains to all things related to spirituality I just have to have the faith to start As I I read John 3, I am struck by this thought that the question that Nicodemus asks is in fact the question that all of humanity is asking. Can my life have a new beginning? Can my future be brighter than my past? Can I have fresh purpose and a new hope? And the answer to those questions is yes, you can because only Christ offers us the opportunity to begin again. And the conversation continues in verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know. We testify what we have seen, but you don't receive our witness. See, if I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him i love it because now for the first time jesus is speaking in a language that nicodemus can understand do you know that when jesus speaks to you he'll speak in a language that you can understand he speaks the language of your heart and nicodemus is an expert of the old covenant a vociferous reader of the Torah, likely memorized word for word the first five books of the Old Covenant called the Pentateuch. Moses is the greatest prophet in the nation of Israel, the great deliverer of God's people out of bondage, functioning as the midwife that brings them to the promised land. And in this moment, Jesus makes the theological connection. And just as Moses rose up that bronze serpent in the wilderness so the son of man will be lifted up and all who look to him will be healed will be forgiven will be set free and will have new life hear me friend if you can look up you can get up (laughs) and if you can get up You can begin day by day in both small ways and big ways, a new beginning with Christ Jesus. No, God doesn't give you a second chance. He gives you your first chance all over again. It's not a redo. It's not a let me kind of erase it so that we can rewrite the script of your life. He says who you were pales in comparison to who you are becoming. That old you, I don't even remember. That's been buried in the sea of forgetfulness, removed from my memory as far as the 
the east is from the west, plunge beneath the blood of my one and only begotten son, and only a God is good, is the one that we read about in the pages of this book, has the authority, the ability, and the necessary kindness to offer you a new lease on life. You might be here today, 60, 70, 80 years old. You've never known Jesus as your personal savior. You feel like I've wasted all of this time. Can I tell you, God can do more in the next 12 months of your life than you accomplished in the last 80 years of your living? Because if you'll trust God with your future, he'll make good on every promise he's ever made you. How can these things happen for me? And Jesus answers, unless you believe, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You got to hear me today. If you hear one thing, hear this. You do not act your way into right believing. You believe your way into right acting. The gospel is not try harder. It is trust Jesus. The gospel is not quit drinking. It is trust Jesus. The gospel is not stop cheating. It is trust Jesus. The gospel is not about what you stop doing. It's about what you start doing. And if you would start by putting your trust in Jesus today, by his grace, you will become sober. By his grace, you will become holy. By his grace, you will become pure. For like St. Athanasius, of the fourth century once said we are becoming by grace what God is by nature and here is the gospel in a nutshell you're dead but you don't have to stay that way for Christ has come that you may live and if you would only believe you can be born again I find myself sometimes as a pastor wrestling with people, debating with people, imploring people, trying to convince people. And what I've recognized often is that in pastoral conversations, what needs to be addressed is the elephant in the room. Are you born again? Because look, you can modify all your behavior. And you can make all the commitments that you ain't never going to fall into that same pattern that you fell in before. And you can read all the self-help books and you can overdose on Tony Robbins and you can download all the DVDs and watch all the podcasts and get all of the information. And you can grow real wise in your own eyes and feel like if I can just get this body under control. I can live my best life. But can I tell you, religion is burdensome, but Jesus will set you free. And if you trust Jesus, all of a sudden you recognize his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And if I'll keep my eyes on the author and the finisher of my faith and what he started, he will complete and he is not done yet. And as Jesus concludes this conversation with Nicodemus, he goes out to the countryside to begin baptizing the crowds. And in the middle of these baptisms, a second conversation breaks out. It's a different moment. It's different people. But it's the same chapter with the same conclusions. Watch. After this, Jesus and and his disciples, they went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and he baptized Now John, John the Baptist, was also baptizing at Enon near Salim because there was plenty of water. And people were coming and being baptized. Now now an argument broke out between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. So they came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one that you testified as the Messiah... He's also baptizing people, and everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. (laughs) The crisis of John 3 is that Jesus is now baptizing more people than John, which presupposes that some of John's guys were were spying on on some of Jesus' guys and, and running back to John with a report that he did not ask for. What are we gonna do, John? The church down the street had more on Sunday than we did. Let me help you today by by giving you the, the, the best response to defeat the spirit of competition that tries to dominate this region. Here it is. There is plenty of water. 
Well, what's a little old church in Snohomish know about Kirkland? Not much, but there's plenty of water. What does a bunch of cowboys from Snohomish know about planting a church on Frat Row next to the University of Washington? Not much, but there is plenty of water to go around. No, we are not in competition with the church down the street. We are in collaboration with co-laborers in the harvest field, for the harvest is great and the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to thrust them out. There's plenty of water to go around. We could have 25 churches all the same size of pursuit and still barely make a dent in this region. There is plenty of water. <laughs> I think when revival takes root in a region, it about don't even matter what church you walk into. You'll walk in since the overwhelming power and presence of God and lives will be transformed. My prayer for Kirkland and beyond is not the success of pursuit. It's the success of Christ's bride, the local church, that there would be houses of fire and wind all across this region, that prodigals would come home, that that God would birth a new Jesus people movement in the Northwest, that this place would be known for revival and for reformation, and that the cry of our heart would not be given to the attention of what the church down the street is doing or is not doing, but we would say, isn't this great? How much water there is. Let's cast the net on the other side and just see what we could catch. Now watch, watch. To this, John replied, verse 27, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. That's a word for someone in here today. You can only receive that which is given from heaven, which means this. You can't manufacture your own call. You can't manufacture your own anointing. You can't manufacture your own skill set. You can't manufacture your own favor. You can't manufacture your own open doors. You can't manufacture your own blessing. You can only receive that which has first come from heaven. But here's the good news. There's an anointing in heaven with your name on it. There's a blessing in heaven with your name on it. There's a calling in heaven with your name on it. There's a testimony in heaven with your name on it. So instead of operating in perpetual insecurity about the person you sit next to who you think is more gifted than you, why don't you just trust God for that which has been tailor-made for your life from the very foundations of the earth? Because there is something God has with your name on it. John says this, verse 28, you yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah. I am only here, I love this, to prepare the way for him. Hmm. See, John 3 records two distinct conversations, but they share the same goal. Jesus is pointing Nicodemus to the kingdom while John is pointing his disciples to the king. John says, of course, I'm not the Messiah. I'm just a steward of that which I've been given. And my job is to point people towards him. I can almost hear John chiding his disciples. Y'all missed the point. You thought the point was our production. You thought the point was our activity. You thought the point was our numbers. You thought the point was our busyness, our influence, the crowds, the energy, the attraction. This has always been the plan. We've received from heaven so we can testify on earth and it is our great joy to point people towards him. What if no one remembers our name in 50 years? But 500,000 come to know Jesus in the Pacific Northwest. What if no one cares about our brand in 30 years, but stadiums get filled with people worshiping God? What if I never write a bestseller? What if we're never liked by no celebrities? What if someone else takes the credit for our work, but a generation in this region encounters Jesus? It would still be our great joy to point people towards him. And I love this, I love this. Watch verse 29, it gets better. Watch what John says. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. <laughs> but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him 
rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Another way that you could say that is this. He who has the attention of the bride is the bridegroom. Whoever the bride pays most attention to is the default bridegroom. The problem is, so often the church has gotten so busy focusing on the wrong stuff, and as a result, we've ended up married to the wrong man. We've married influence and forsaken authority. We've married relevance and forsaken righteousness. We've married the spirit of the age only to be widowed in the next. Oh, but if God would capture the attention of the church once again with just one look, things would begin to shift and change. There is still a bridegroom who longs for his bride. And at his voice, our joy is fulfilled. See, all throughout the New Testament, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. Ephesians 5, Revelation 21, 2 Corinthians 11, Matthew 25, just to name a few. When Paul writes to the believers in Ephesus, he uses the analogy of marriage, the two becoming one flesh, to describe the way that Christ through covenant has bound himself to his bride, the local church. Paul says, it's a mystery. Oh, I've seen the church, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's a mystery why Christ would choose church to reveal his glory in the earth. But in a world flooded with crap, the church is still the best thing afloat. Let me end with this story. On Friday night, I attended an event at the Bellevue Weston. It was the president's banquet for Northwest University and raising money for scholarships for kids and celebrating the faithfulness of God over the last academic year. And the event went late and I was talking to friends. And by the time that I was driving home to Snohomish, I began to feel like a little sick in the car ride. I was was, was there alone. I was driving myself and just thinking to myself, man, I'm tired. It's been a long week. I'm just exhausted. I just need to make it home. And pretty soon, all of a sudden, it's like I got hit with what felt like a hot flash. Now, I'm too young to have hot flashes, and I'm also the wrong gender, but it just, I can sympathize with your menopausal estate today because I experienced a hot flash. And I'm wearing my suit and my tie, and I'm I'm buttoning my shirt, taking off my suit coat, and I'm rolling down my window to try to get in the cold air. And I'm thinking, it's February in Seattle. It cannot be this hot. And pretty soon my vision started to go blurry. And and I was swerving all across the road. And and, 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 and now finally, at at, at the last moment when I felt like maybe I was going to lose control of the car, I pulled off to the side of the road, barely opened the door before I projectile vomited everywhere. I stumbled to the side of the road. I fell down. Started seizing up, puking. (laughs) I was like, God, I ain't going out like this, you know. I need a better story than puking on the side of the road and then going home to eternity, you know. It's just not going to work. And, and, I, and I, I'm trying to get my bearings and I'm trying to, trying to be able to see straight and get less dizzy and stop puking. And, and I'm, just try, I'm just trying to feel a little bit sane so I can feel well enough to drive home. And before too long, I noticed red and blue lights flashing behind me. As the Snohomish County Sheriff is is getting out of his car and coming up behind me with a flashlight, he says, sir, are you okay? I'm looking up at him, clothes are drenched, I look like a mess, half my shirt is unbuttoned. I go, I think I'm fine. (laughs) He asked me the question you know that's coming next. How much have you had to drink tonight? 
And I'm trying to like provide context, you know? And I'm like, now listen, I was at a fundraiser, which was probably the wrong thing to say because at a fundraiser, the more you drink, the more you give, you know? And I was like, no, it wasn't like that. It was for a Christian university. I'm a pastor in the region. He's looking at me like, oh yeah, sure you are, you know? <laughs> he says, no, listen, you can tell me. It's just, it's just me and you, you can tell me. And then I start to have like a panic attack. I get nervous because I was like, I did have two glasses of lemonade. And maybe one of those naughty freshmen spiked the juice. <clears throat> he said, I'll be right back. Goes back to his car and he walks up to me with this machine I've never seen before. It's got a straw on one end and a box on the other end. He says, now, sir, I'm going to need you to breathe in this box for about 10 seconds straight. And we're going to see whether you are drunk or not. So I blow in this thing for 10 seconds until the machine makes this noise. He takes a step back, looks at the machine, looks back at me, looks at the machine, looks back at me. And he gave me this look like I've pulled over a thousand guys and I've heard the same line a thousand times. And you are the only person who actually blew in this machine in your disheveled estate and are not actually inebriated. He said, you need me to call you an, an aid car? I said, no, nah, I just... Give me five minutes, I'll be okay, I, I'll make it home, and I did. <laughs> but I was thinking about that story as I was reading John 3 this week. I, I found myself sitting in the car trying to debate and prove myself to an officer of the law. I felt like Peter on the day of Pentecost. I am not drunk as you suppose. It's, it's not what it looks like. And I know it looks bad. And I, I know you've seen this a thousand times. And, and I know what you're thinking. Another guy who's just lying to me to try to get out of a traffic ticket or a potential arrest. And I know what it seems like from the outside in. I know what your experiences in the past would have led you to believe about this present moment. But I am appealing to you today it is not what it appears to be and it hit me in that moment if you were to turn on TV and you were to watch the news or, or to read the blogs you you would see that the bride of Christ, especially over the last number of years, has faced some hardships and some trials and, and, and some terrors. And the pure and, 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 and spotless bride of, of, of Christ has, has in many ways seen better days. And it seems like every time you hear breaking news about a pastor, you're like, oh God, I don't even want to read the story because it's not going to be good. <laughs> And so often, I feel like the church gets caught in this dichotomous conversation where we are trying to prove to the world that we are not what they think that we are. And we've been moved away from our central task, which is not to defend ourselves to the world, but instead to glorify Jesus. And in doing so, bring people into an encounter with his presence. And I'm not trying to gloss over the pain or the mud or the muck or the mire that seems to have affected the bride of Christ over the last few years, but I am still convinced, like John the Baptist in John 3, that although the bride is dark, she is still lovely. And it it is still my great joy to hear his voice, to sense his presence, to experience his glory, to be enamored by his personhood, to feel his nearness in my life. Sympathize with John, but, but for a moment today, everything that he has built in the wilderness, he is losing right before his eyes. The disciples that he has accumulated, the crowds that gathered to hear his message of repentance. And in one finite moment, in the middle of John 3, he sees these people leaving in droves because the one that they have been waiting for has arrived. Not only that, but John is staring down the hallway of his untimely death at the hands of a demonized ruler who will take his head for John committing the high crime of prophetically rebuking his sexual immorality. John wears camel hair in the wilderness, eats locusts and honey. In many ways, he is the New Testament version of the Old Testament prophet Elijah. 
He has given his life for this moment. And even his own followers are shook. Aren't you irritated? Aren't you insecure? Aren't you worried? Aren't you upset? And John, in brilliant and in poignant fashion, redirects them to the express purpose for why he lives, to prepare the way for the bridegroom to meet his bride. Can I tell you, friend, that the way you see the church is a reflection of the discipline of your perspective. Because if you've lived long enough, you've been hurt by a church or two. You've been abandoned by a leader or two. You've been lied to by a leader or two. You used to have a best friend that sat next to you and now they sit on the other side of the sanctuary and you hope you don't see them. That neighbor that you don't like all of a sudden started showing up to the service you attend. Let's not even talk about your in-laws who wanna come to the church now. And the problem is, is that we don't see things the way they are. We see things the way we are. And we get hurt and we get wounded and we get offended and people leave and people go and people misunderstand us and we get caught up in competition and the world floods our mind with every negative image associated with the bride. And if we're not careful, Pretty soon, we're not able to see the heart. We only look on the outward and not realize the sacredness of what God is doing on the inside. And my plea to you this morning, friend, is simply this. This church will not be perfect, and this pastor will not be perfect, and this staff will not be perfect. And it is inevitable that at a certain moment in time, if you hang with here long enough, there will be something someone does that triggers a moment of pain from your past season. And you're going to have to make the decision that although the bride looks messy, Although I pulled over the car that was swerving, it is not what it appears to be. For if the bride is still lovely to God, the bride is still lovely to me. And only a God as good as Jesus kneels down and into the muck and the mire of our life, unoffended by what we have been through, unembarrassed of our wretched estate. And he makes beautiful things out of that which has been on the ash heap of history. And he says, I know you've been hurt. I know you've been abused. I know you've been abandoned, but you are still lovely to me. Because this Jesus still takes his bride, washes her by his word, presents her spotless without stain or wrinkle to the Father. Because the church is not plan B, it is still plan A. You've got to make a decision in your life, friend like John the Baptist makes near the end of the third chapter of John. That out of all the ways that I could see this Jesus, and out of all the ways that I could see this bride, and out of all the ways that I could contextualize this moment, I'm making the decision to discipline my perspective by being mindful of my purpose, which is to prepare the way for him. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, Lottie, but, but I feel like especially the church in the Northwest has had some mud thrown on her. Some of it's been self-induced. Some of it's been our fault. But if we could make the decision to love what God loves, then God will enable us to see what He sees. It don't take faith to see dirt. It don't take faith to see problems. It don't take faith to see mistakes. 
It don't take faith to see things that happen that shouldn't have happened. It takes faith to look past the exterior into the interior and recognize that even in the midst of the mess, the church is still beautiful to Jesus. And when the church is beautiful to Jesus and it becomes beautiful to us, then we will not treat it as used product. We will not treat it as a bride with a scarlet letter. We will not treat it as a reflection of the mistakes of others, but instead, as the great grand design of God to reveal his glory and beauty in the earth. Oh, if you find a perfect church, don't attend it. You'll ruin it. The only thing perfect at pursuit is a man named Jesus. And by his stripes and through his wounds and by his ever efficacious atonement, he sets us on a firm foundation, speaks value over our lives, and declares over us today, you're not what they think you are. You are what I say you are. And some of you here, you, you, you have lived under the bondage of the way that you have looked. You, you have lived under the bondage of yesteryear's narrative. You have lived under the bondage of that mistake you made, that divorce you had, that abuse that you experienced. You have lived under the weight of that. And isn't it tragic that sometimes it is the people who are closest to us who can't see us for who we are now? And you've got to know today, friend, that what people have said about you pales in comparison to what God knows to be true. And it's not just that the church as a corporation is beautiful to him. It's that the people who make up the church are treasure in earthen vessels that he delights in, which means God doesn't just love you because he has to. He likes you in the midst of your mess. And if we'll keep our eyes on Jesus, he will make our path straight. He will establish the very steps of our feet. And in doing so, we can build something here in this region that won't be perfect, but that will reveal, reveal through its multifaceted fractures the beauty and the brilliance of the God that we serve. Maybe you're here today and you felt like, man, I, I don't even know if I can engage really with church again because when I look at church, it's just the mess that I see. <laughs> and I, I can't promise you that this new chapter in your life is gonna be easy, but it'll be well worth it to have your perspective redeemed and washed by the word of Christ and in doing so, choose by faith to know and see, believe and receive that which God has foreordained for you in eternity's past. Maybe you're here today, and if, and if you were to be honest, you're, you're feeling like Nicodemus. You've, you've got this holy curiosity. You've got this spiritual dissatisfaction, but you have yet to connect the dots. Maybe you're, you're here today, and you, you feel like the disciples of John the Baptist, disaffected by the circumstances of life, wondering, has everything I've built really come to this finite conclusion? I don't know where you're at today, friend, but, but Jesus does. And he would invite you unto new life today. Come on, would you stand with me as we close? Let me pray for you today. And in doing so, encourage you in the Lord. Huh. The bride's got some battle wounds. But the lion of the tribe of Judah, at his roar, the enemies of God run. <laughs> the bride's got some scars. She's been through some stuff. But the church, this place, this room, these altars, they're still beautiful to Jesus. And may they be beautiful to us. Father, now in the mighty name of your son, I thank you.